remarks. This is Mr. Uh, Tony Fitzgerald. Okay, how's everybody doing this morning? All right, we ready for PT? Okay, do as I say, not as I can't do. I feel like that. All right, so uh, first of all, um, I want to thank everybody for attending um, this event. You know, when we think about our veterans, right, one thing about me that's near and dear to my heart is taking care of those veterans. Because without them, we are not afforded the freedoms that we have every day. You know, I don't know if anybody's been to any bad countries, and any places where people are not allowed to exercise their rights, not here in the United States. And it's because of the men and women that have raised their right hand and took that oath of service. So thank you for being a partner and helping and making sure that we keep them whole and that we keep them safe. I want to thank you all for coming today and for the work you do to keep our community safe also. I want to extend a special thank you to James Brown and Carolina Brown. Where's James at? Where's your wife at? In the kitchen. Always working. Um, I do want to say something personal about James and, and Carolina. You know, I've, I've been here 18 years at the VA Palo Alto Healthcare System in different jobs. And I can tell you, uh, when I met James and his wife um, through the Wine Country Marines organization, they have been a godsend in regards to taking care of veterans. Anytime I have a problem uh, with needing to help a veteran, all I gotta do is call James. The stuff that we probably can't do, such as getting vehicles for veterans, helping a, a homeless veteran have uh, money to stay in a hotel, and all kind of different things. James has always been there in that organization. And James helped us put this together. I said, you know, I wanna try to see if we can get the law enforcement community together to help keep a veteran safe so that you guys understand some of the things that veterans go through. And for his leadership in bringing everyone together to develop this training. I also want to thank Matt Walsh of the San Jose Police Department for his expertise in identifying the most beneficial materials that make the training successful. Military veterans and law enforcement officers share a close bond, each characterized by discipline, courage, and selflessness. Currently, only 6% of the U.S. population has ever served in the military, yet 19% of law enforcement officers are veterans. And Ryan, what is our numbers here? How many vets? Veteran police officers? Yes. We're at 98%. There's two people in the department that are not vets. And our police department is 60, 61. 61. So most of our veterans are actually uh, prior 95 Bravo, I'm old Army surger, uh, soldiers. I was 95 Bravo, that's military police and other services where they had uh, a police, I don't know what the MLS number is. But 90% uh, of law, uh, law enforcement officers are veterans. Our very own VA police are made up of nearly all veterans and is in no doubt that military service clearly brings a lot to the table. However, we know military service may also lead to significant challenges when transitioning back to civilian life. We hope today's session helps you to understand those challenges including post-traumatic stress disorder, homelessness, and increased risk of suicide, and what resources exist to help veterans overcome these challenges. I want to kind of stop for a second again. So did anybody, everybody get one of these? Has everybody ever seen one of these cards, right? So this is the Veterans Crisis Line card. We have thousands and thousands, so any police, uh, force or share anybody that needs them, we can get you thousands of them. And uh, I know James Brown has been giving them out to many uh, law enforcement uh, departments uh, throughout our catchment area, but they're here. I want to tell a little story about this card and I'll give you the little significant uh, significance about this. We had a um, veteran that actually presented on this site, called this number, and said he was thinking about hurting himself. What was that, Ryan? About a year ago. Say so think about hurting himself. We pinged his phone, found that veteran, and that veteran did not hurt himself that day, just because of this number. So if we spend a billion dollars on these and we save one veteran, I'm okay with that. I just want to make sure I say that. 
So we give these out to people like bars and different places, schools. Every time I get a chance to speak, I talk about this and I tell people, put this number in your phone. Share it with your family members, your church members, and all those things, right? It's not the cure-all, but it's an additional tool to have in your toolbox. You will hear from a number of VA staff and content experts, as well as a very special guest, U.S. Army veteran, Mark Latke, who will provide some insight on interacting with law enforcement from a veteran's perspective. Our goal today is to equip you with knowledge, skills, and resources for interacting with veterans safely and effectively. Again, I want to extend our warmest welcome. We look forward to strengthening our partnership with you and better serve our nation's veterans. Key word being partnership. And like I said a little bit earlier, it's everybody's responsibility to help a veteran because every veteran has helped us. Even if you don't know them, they have helped us keep the freedom and have the freedoms that we are afforded on a daily basis, every veteran. And if you're looking for the price or the cost of freedom, it's right here at this facility. We take care of uh, 92,000 veterans at this, in this, within my healthcare system. It goes from um, Sonora all the way to Mon Monterey. 92,000 enrolled veterans we take care of and are responsible. We have 9 million veterans in America that receive care in VA, but 92,000 of them are here in this area. So thank you for what you do every day. We really, really value this partnership and anything we can do to foster, enhance, and make it better, let us know. Because we one team, one mission, one goal. Okay? So thank you. All right. Thank you, Tony, and thank you everybody uh, again for being here. My name is David Grillo. I am the assistant chief of our homeless programs and also the director of our um, criminal justice outreach programs, which I'm going to tell you some about today. Um, so uh, first, I just wanted to start off introducing you all to the VA system. Some of you may know it well. Um, some of you may actually receive your care here if you're a veteran or have family members who do, but I know a lot of people don't. So I wanted to give an overview of the VA nationally and then locally uh, before I go into um, some of the statistics on veterans who are actually in the justice system and the programs that we use to, uh, to reach out to them. So uh, the VA itself is the largest integrated healthcare system in the country. Um, and I want to share some, some fun facts because not everybody knows this. The VA is responsible for a fairly extensive list of discoveries and advances um, in medicine, surgery, uh, healthcare delivery, and so forth. Uh, actually, three Nobel Prize winners um, have come out of the VA's um, uh, system, as well as three Lasker Award winners, which is sort of like the American medicine version of the Nobel Prize. So um, over 75% of all US medical students and residents receive training at the VA. So without the VA, the healthcare in this country would look very different than it does today. Um, on a national level, um, regardless of, uh, of what you may hear, uh, there are some problems, but on a national level, VA consistently rates higher in satisfaction indicators than private health services do. Um, and you can see um, results from a recent uh, American Customer Satisfaction Index uh, survey there. Um, with very high marks for VA, uh, for patient loyalty to our services, and those who are highly willing to use both inpatient and outpatient care here. Um, we also know more veterans are actually taking advantage of using the VA uh, than previous generations. You can see uh, an increase uh, from 2008 to 2016 uh, in the percentage of American veterans who actually use the VA for their health care. So it's, it's inching up. Um, in terms of uh, the quality of care, um, I wanted to share this with you. There's different studies out there, but this is actually the largest, this largest um, one of the largest mental health uh, treatment comparison studies that's ever been done. It was a comparison between um, a VA versus private sector mental health uh, care. 1.3 million veterans were included in the study. 
So in every domain that was examined, VA performance was found to be superior to that of the private sector by more than 30%. Um, this is particularly true for veterans with very serious mental illnesses like schizophrenia, major depression. They're more than twice as likely to receive the appropriate medication treatment initially when they present for services. And uh, veterans with depression were twice as likely to receive appropriate long-term treatment as well than compared to the private sector. Um, and some other uh, indicators as well. So uh, that to say, we have a very good and robust mental health system in particular at the VA. Um, so uh, it, it's important to remember that when we're um, sort of helping a veteran get into VA mental health services to know that they're actually quality services that that really do help. Um, so we know also that linkage to VA treatment can be life-saving for a veteran. Uh, sadly, I'll say since 2001, the rate of suicide among veterans um, has gone up overall. But we know that the rate has gone up um, less quickly or uh, to a lesser extent for veterans who use the VA. Um, so suicide rates for male veterans who actually use the VA have gone up 11 percent since 2001, but that's compared to more than three times that number for veterans who don't use the VA. With females, it's far more stark, about 5 percent increase compared to a nearly 100 percent increase for female veterans who don't use the VA. Um, so the, the, when you graph it out, it sort of looks like, like this. So this is why we say um, uh, getting a veteran linked to VA care can, can save their life because the, the research bears that out. So um, that's the VA system. So uh, what do we know about veterans in the justice system? So veterans that you all might uh, encounter. Approximately uh, eight to 10 percent of any given uh, incarcerated population, whether it be a, a county jail that we look at, state prisons, federal prisons, um, typically when you um, when you look at the population who's there, eight to 10 percent will be military vets. Um, so we have about 150,000 vets who are being released annually from jails and prisons, very large number. Um, what we know about them is that more than three quarters received discharges that were honorable or under honorable conditions, which would allow them to actually receive services from the VA. So the vast majority are, are folks that we could link to treatment services if we know they're there. So um, half of all combat vets with PTSD have been arrested one or more times, which I find to be uh, quite an amazing statistic given the prevalence of PTSD for veterans and not just those who served in combat. Um, so half uh, with, with combat PTSD have been arrested at least one time in their life. And we know uh, veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan um, who have PTSD are more than twice as likely to be arrested as other vets. So the younger generation of vets are at increased risk of interaction with you all in law enforcement and being arrested. So uh, treatment needs. More than half of these veterans uh, who've been arrested have at least one mental health concern. This is based on research, but I can tell you in practice, the veterans that we see when we go into the jails and the courts, it, it's, it's essentially 100%. Um, so one study uh, found nearly 40% of veterans in jail screened positive for PTSD. And substance use disorder um, are a major concern. Uh, nearly everybody that we see in the jails um, uh, has a substance use disorder of some kind, and usually they have a co-occurring mental health disorder. So uh, complex mental health and, and uh, perhaps PTSD, depression, alcohol use disorder, these things all go hand in hand and they can all land a veteran in, in jail. Uh, and we also know that incarceration is actually the single largest predictor of um, a veteran becoming uh, homeless. So when veterans are incarcerated, they become astronomically at higher risk of uh, becoming homeless after their release. So knowing all this, the VA created a program uh, called Healthcare for Reentry Veterans in 2006. Um, this was outreach to veterans, sort of on the back, very furthest back end of the justice system, those releasing from state and federal prison facilities. Um, so after a few years, we had some data on this program and realized that it was pretty successful. 
And so this involved a VA social worker or other staff person going to the, the facilities and talking to vets um, and helping them plan their release so that they're not homeless, that they're linked to treatment. Given the success of the program, the VA said, well, why, why are we just limiting this to the back end of the justice system? Why don't we, we uh, be more proactive and get to veterans sooner? And so Veterans Justice Outreach, or VJO, which some of you may have heard about, um, was created in 2009. And this was outreach uh, to county jails and to the court system and also uh, to law enforcement like yourself. So um, we're trying to, as proactively as possible, reach veterans at the earliest point in the justice system that we can. Um, if we can avoid arrest, that's even, that's even better. If they have to be arrested, we want to be able to, to see them and help them as soon in that process as possible. So our, our mission in VJO is essentially to, uh, to link veterans uh, to VA treatment services um, as needed to avoid them having to be incarcerated for um, a longer period of time uh, than is necessary. So we do this by um, essentially going into jails and courts. We screen veterans for their eligibility. A lot of times these veterans had no idea that they were eligible for VA care. And we've actually found that when we ask, uh, it depends on how we ask the question in jails. If we say, um, are you a veteran? We get a very low response rate because a lot of veterans don't use that word. They think like my grandfather was in World War II and he's a, he's a veteran, but I was just in Iraq. Uh, they don't associate with the word as much. When we ask the question, did you ever serve in the US Armed Forces, we get about double the response rate. So um, if you're in the field as an officer and you're asking the question, are you a veteran, um, you're likely to get the same lower response rate. Uh, so if you ask it, did you ever serve in the US Armed Forces, you'll most likely get a much higher rate. So we're in there, we're asking that question. Um, we're helping veterans get enrolled. We're linking them to treatment in the appropriate level of care, whether that be housing assistance, um, mental health, substance use treatment, and so forth. We also do um, direct releases from jail custody to VA treatment. So we know that um, risk of relapse is very high in the in the day or two following release from custody, and you all probably see this where you arrest the same person um, over and over again, or someone that you know was just released. Um, so because of that high risk of relapse after release, we're trying to get veterans directly from jail with no point in between straight into a VA a residential treatment program uh, in cases where we're able to do that. So. Um, that is our mission. It sort of looks like this. Uh, the justice outreach specialist is in the middle of this uh, puzzle here, and we get referrals from everybody. So um, I'll say it at the end of my presentation, but I'll, I'll say it again now. Uh, if you arrest a veteran, it would be helpful if you would let us know so that we, we don't really have good means of identifying veterans in jail custody. So we rely on um, friends, family, jail staff, police officers to let us know, hey, this guy, we booked him in. Um, if you could go see him and help him out, uh, that would help us out. So uh, we take that information from all these different sources, and then we go link the veteran to what they need. So um, I've given you an overview of, um, of uh, the VA in general, but I'll just give you some specific um, information on our healthcare system, which Tony described as being very large. It's considered to be among the best in the country um, because of our affiliation with Stanford and the excellent medical providers who are here. Um, we serve a large number of veterans and are home to a large number of specialty treatment centers that are available here that may not be available in other parts of the state or the country. So we're very fortunate to, to have nearly every kind of resource that a veteran might um, might need, whether it's medical, mental health, uh, specialty mental health, inpatient services, residential programs, um, different substance use uh, programs, outpatient programs. Um, it pretty much runs the whole spectrum. Uh, housing assistance, which you'll hear more about specifically because we know that's a, a concern when you're interacting with uh, homeless veterans in the community. Um, 
employment and some services that you're simply just not going to get in the private sector. Um, your, your doctor probably won't come see you in jail, uh, your, your private doctor, but the VA will. Um, uh, I'll skip over some of this in the interest of time, um, but uh, suffice to say we, we also treat um, what we call criminogenic thinking. So um, veterans who may have some kind of antisocial tendencies and they're constantly uh, getting in jail, we have treatment for that also that we do specifically. Um, say a few words about veterans treatment courts because um, uh, that is something that really needs to be said. Um, the goal of vet courts, reduce recidivism, treat the disorders that were caused by military service, repair the veterans record, and eliminate fines and fees um, where possible. Rest uh, restitution cannot be forgiven, but other fines and fees can. And um, we do this as a partnership between the VA and the court system. So the courts, um, they belong to the, to the county, but we're there as a partner. We bring our services into the courtroom, um, and uh, we refer veterans to uh, various treatment services and report to the court on whether or not they're attending them. Hey, David? Yeah. Just so you know, um, he arrived after you started. Judge Newman is sitting to your uh, left. Uh. And, Sure, sure. Uh, would you like to say, to say a few words uh, about that? Or? Uh, I, I can. Go ahead and finish sure. your, uh, your talk. Okay. Um, and so we're addressing, uh, we're addressing treatment needs, but also um, many veterans courts will have peer mentors who are a part of the court, so other veterans who have been through the process um, that can sort of put an arm around the vet and encourage them and help them navigate. Um, so it's really uh, quite a thing. Uh, the judge will be able to speak to this I'm sure better than I could if you have specific questions, but um, two state penal codes uh, in California actually um, consider whether or not a criminal defendant is a veteran and if they had um, some sort of mental health issue that contributed to the criminal behavior that actually stemmed from military service. So if a veteran has PTSD um, and they uh, commit, let's say, uh, an assault or something to that extent. Um, and it can be linked back to um, an inability to sort of um, manage emotions caused by PTSD from military combat. That could be considered in sentencing. And so 1170.9 is the uh, post-sentencing version of this, and 1001.80 is the pre-sentencing um, uh, version of this that allows for diversion um, from uh, from adjudication, and if the veteran goes to treatment, they do everything right, then the charges can be dropped uh, as though they, basically as though they never happened. Um, so uh, just one final thing I'll say about veterans courts is, uh, well, do they work? So we know from Bureau of Justice statistics that recidivism rates generally are really bad. Um, so if you look at within one year of release, from state prisons, you're talking almost 60% will be rearrested in that, in that same year. Um, and the numbers just go up from there. Uh, we know that Veterans Court in Santa Clara has been operational since 2008, and they report recidivism rates of approximately 15%, which is a huge improvement. And we have some courts in the nation who report recidivism rates of 0%. Uh, percent. So, um, they work. They work just about as well as anything that we've seen in the justice system. We have a number of active courts locally in the, the 10 counties that we cover. Um, your county may be represented there. Um, so again, if you arrest a veteran, contact us. Um, let us know. Uh, if you get any of those numbers, just make sure you get mine, the top one there. Um, or take a picture of this with your phone so you can see which counties uh, people cover. But uh, you arrest a veteran, let us know. We may be able to go see them in jail and help them out. Um, so uh, I want to leave it at that in the interest of time. And judge, if you wanted to say, uh, say anything else. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to be present at uh, 
this meeting. My name is Socrates Peter Manukian. I'm a local yokel having lived in uh, this area since 1960, same house near Foothill College. Uh, I never served in the uh, military. I tried to enlist in the Marine Corps after uh, college, but I had four hip operations in high school, and uh, uh, that was an automatic disqualifier in the early 70s. I, I tried telling the recruiter I played football and wrestled. I didn't tell him I wasn't any good, but at least I did it. <laughs> didn't work. Uh, my oldest son, uh, Matt, uh, first started talking about being a Marine when he was seven years old. And uh, uh, he wanted to enlist right after uh, high school. Uh, we told him, no, go to college first. Graduated from St. Francis High School 2001. Uh, September 2001, he told us that uh, uh, after 9-11, he was going to drop out of uh, College, University of Arizona, and joined the Marines. And he failed the physical because of a football injury. Later, it turned out he had a spinal cord tumor. He had operations to fix that and uh, graduated from University of Arizona in 2005 and entered Marine Corps OCS 2006, commissioned as a uh, second lieutenant, did uh, four combat deployments in uh, five years. He was uh, killed August 10th, uh, 2012, on an insider attack. He had joined uh, the MARSOC, as it was called then, Marine Raiders Now, Special Operations. And uh, it was a green on blue shooting, and he stood between his uh, guys and the shooter and uh, saved them, and uh, he, he was killed along with two other Marines. He never told me much about what he was doing in the Marine Corps. Every day was a good day. Uh, yeah, there's nothing going on here. Uh, it's, uh, it's real peaceful, real quiet. Uh, I had to read uh, English language Arabic newspapers to find out what was going on in the areas he was in. And reading after reading about one firefight uh, in his town, he said, you know, the, the Arabic media lies about everything. There was nothing like that happening. Well, it turned out he was in a lot of uh, combat and uh, uh, one place, uh, his first deployment in special operations at a place called Forward Operating Base Robinson in uh, uh, southern Helmand Province. Uh, he was, uh, he uh, took over the uh, uh, base after the British abandoned it. And uh, he kept telling us every day, uh, nothing going on here. The, the Taliban just up and left. There's, there's nothing here. After he was killed, about a year after that event, my wife grabbed a bunch of papers out of his uh, apartment in his house, in our house down south. And one of them was a uh, Navy Marine Corps commendation medal for engaging the Taliban in 25 gunfights. In this period, the time he told us that uh, uh, nothing was going on. Um, we never really noticed any personality disorder in him, but with some of his other guys, we found out that you know the stress of the combat, and these are uh, Marines who were taught to survive and be tough and gut it out, and so they were really good at denying that they had any problem with anything. And that pretty much went across, uh, as uh, I've been involved with, uh, now I'm back in felony department uh, for the last three years, and seeing that a lot of the vets uh, at some point deny that they're, they have any mental disorders whatsoever. So we uh, uh, explained the process, as you probably all know. And by the way, I, I want to thank the first responders, who, you men and women in law enforcement, who have to make major decisions on extremely little information. And sometimes it's bad information at that. And uh, everyone's really good at second-guessing cops in the field without knowing what they were looking at. So I want to thank you for, for that in the, for, uh, in the first place. So we see these uh, uh, vets at an arraignment, and, and as judges, we know very little about them. Uh, quite often, there's nothing more than a police report uh, about bizarre behavior or uh, something like that. And uh, it's hard to tell whether or not the person has a uh, drug problem or a mental health problem or 
quite often both. Uh, so uh, with uh, what we see in, uh, in our court system is once we find out that somebody is a vet, as you heard, it is easy to connect them with services and the advantages that the vets have that uh, uh, other people don't is that there's better follow-up uh, through the VA and other support facilities, other organizations. A uh, typical case of uh, someone who's got mental health or, uh, and or drug disorders is they are uh, arrested, brought to court, uh, they can't think clearly, quite often they're uh, in withdrawal. And uh, the public defender is appointed to represent them. And our county public defender's office is pretty well set up to uh, deal with mental health issues uh, on their uh, uh, counter. They have support people and so on. So uh, we appoint a, a lawyer and then uh, quite often I'll put on, say on the minutes, uh, uh, jail psychiatrist to, to please see and evaluate. And I do that a lot because uh, government liability is based on the concept of notice. If, you, if the government official or employee knows of a particular problem, uh, there's uh, more likely to be accountability if there's a mishap. So every time a judge puts on the uh, minutes, uh, jail mental health, uh, please evaluate. Uh, they'll, they'll do it and they will prescribe a, a, a prop. Sometimes getting people to take the medications or talk to the psychiatrist in the first place is a problem. But eventually, after a month or two, if, if they haven't bailed out, most of the time they don't, um, we see some improvement. They look better, they, they talk more clearly, they, uh, they're more articulate, they gain some weight even from eating eating food. And so uh, a lot of times the offenses for which they are in custody are not particularly serious. They're, they're released to the community and there's, uh, they're given instructions to go to the re-entry center or see a probation officer and so forth. Uh, if somebody is homeless, mentally ill, uh, mental health disorders, uh, doesn't have a place to go, doesn't have a car, doesn't have telephone, cell phone, whatever, they're harder to follow up and they get lost and we see them back again uh, when they commit a new offense. With the vets, as uh, was pointed out, because our Veterans Court has uh, Judge Manley, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the uh, second team, by the way, I wish Judge Manley were here, but he was unavailable for this. Stephen Manley is the uh, mental health uh, vets court guru at our court. He's in the New Family Justice Center, and in his uh, department, uh, he's got pretty much uh, the whole floor where they have social workers and psychiatrists and uh, uh, people to, uh, to talk to uh, uh, the inmates while they're making their court appearances, and that usually works out better. Um, I always uh, uh, seem to do well with some of the vets because one thing the inmates do is they talk and they say, hey, the judge's son was a Marine. And so, so I always ask them about their service and uh, uh, thank you for your service and so on and try to get them as part of the uh, uh, process to realize that mental health disorders is not something people shouldn't talk about. It's like if you have a broken leg, you go to the orthopedic surgeon. If you have uh, stomach pains, you go to a gastroenterologist, and having mental health problems is uh, something that can be taken care of by a mental health official. So, uh, Judge Manley's people uh, and uh, the other judges uh, in the court are now there are learning there's uh, new legislation passed involving uh, mental health diversion. So if somebody has committed a crime of certain type, usually not a serious or violent felony, they are available uh, or they are uh, able to go to uh, diversion programs which will expunge records and so forth. Uh, that is very new. We can't predict how well that's going to, to do because uh, in, in my view, the overarching uh, problem of uh, most of our criminal offenses is uh, drug abuse. 
methamphetamine is too easy to get. Uh, marijuana is now becoming legal and uh, uh, heroin is making a, a comeback. LSD is making a comeback. Uh, Pencyclidine <coughs> is making a comeback. I hadn't seen a PCP case for many years and all of a sudden I'm, st well, you, you know all this already that uh, you're seeing drugs coming back that hadn't been uh, uh, available before. And uh, now that uh, uh, marijuana is becoming uh, easier to get, the Mexican cartels are getting out of that line of work and making uh, uh, methamphetamine with uh, Chinese uh, uh, products that is far superior in anything or far more deadly than anything we're seeing on the street. By the way, if any of you have a question at any time, don't hesitate to, uh, to interrupt. So um, we have uh, programs that will assist not only veterans, but all, all people. The uh, court uh, and county have worked together on a reentry system to uh, provide uh, job opportunities to individuals who've gone through the criminal justice system and finding employers to, to find uh, 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 jobs for some of these people that are uh, otherwise homeless, but with the cost of housing being around uh, what it is now in San Jose, a one-bedroom apartment goes for uh, twenty-three hundred dollars. That's that's pretty hard for for a lot of people. Um, so uh, uh, the the best uh, success uh, strategy is. Uh, support and follow-up after uh, people are released from custody. That works well for the vets because of the VA system, not so much for uh, for uh, uh, the rest of the jail population. <coughs> Anything specific, I can answer any question you might have. Well, I'll be around this morning. If someone, some of you want to uh, talk to me, I'll, I'll be more than happy to uh, to, uh, to talk. All right, thank you. And uh, before I turn it over to the next presenter, I just wanted to call your attention to uh, a specific uh, resource card that uh, James was able to uh, get us a couple hundred uh, copies of. So I wanted to pass this out. So this is a, a pocket-sized card, a business uh, card, with uh, the Veterans Crisis Line on one side, and four resources that I think, uh, as officers, you will find very useful on the other side. So um, we have VA police services, and you'll hear from Chief Jones, um, our police chief, as well later on uh, today. We have Chief Jones's um, his direct number. Uh, we have the VA Homelessness uh, Housing Assistance Hotline and also uh, caregiver support for uh, family members of, of veterans who take care of them. And uh, again, on the front, the front side of this is the number that our director, Tony, was, was talking about that saves veterans' lives, um, our Veterans Crisis Line. So um, that's going around. Please, please take some, um, as many as you need, and, and pass it along. Um, and so, uh, f uh, Fred, um, yeah, ready? Um, I'm going to turn it over to our suicide prevention coordinator, Fred McRae. Hi. Um, before we get started with the PowerPoints, again, we view, especially the suicide prevention coordinators, myself, Karen Nersesova, and Aaron Dale, you guys, we recognize what heroes you guys are. Um, we, there really isn't a day that goes by where we're not calling at least one welfare check, sometimes five or six welfare checks on veterans in danger. And I know sometimes it might be confusing because we're often sending a welfare check on someone who said, I'm gonna kill myself. Um, by the time you get this email, I will be dead. And you guys obviously go out immediately, assess the situation, often bring them in for a rescue. You're also getting calls from us that 
uh, we need a welfare check on this veteran because they missed their uh, podiatry appointment. And that's probably a little confusing. Uh, you're not truant officers. We're not truant officers. But these are the veterans that we've got flagged as a high risk for and podiatry appointment is unusual. Uh, but these are veterans we've got flagged as a high risk for suicide. As a, a director Fitzgerald was saying, we've got 92,000 registered enrolled veterans in our system. About 130 of them-ish, under 140 always, um, are flagged as a high risk for suicide. This is someone whose behavior has been so dangerous, uh, so impulsive, typically multiple suicide attempts, that when they have a responsibility to let us know when they're not going to make an appointment. They know that we may call a welfare check. We, when they miss an appointment, we call them multiple times. If we can't reach them, we confer with their mental health crew. We're not worried about if the podiatrist thinks they're in danger. But we're going to, and I don't mean to dig, uh, kick podiatrists, but no pun there. But, um, <laughs> but uh, these are people we're really, really worried about. And they know that a welfare check is likely if they don't respond to, to our calls, if they miss an appointment. So we check with the mental health team to see how they've been doing recently. What do you think's going on? Do they just, are they erratic? Did they just not charge their phone? Should we give them a couple of days to respond? Or what's going on? Oh no, they've been really anxious about that court date. They're going through a separation. They've had a conflict with a family. They might be homeless right now. We think they're at this location. Um, and then this is someone who, though the trigger for the call seems routine, this is someone who very likely, when they slip off the grid, they're very likely to be suicidal. And I'd say, I was just, Karen and I were conferring about this anecdotally, we're looking at probably a um, 20 to 40% rate of when we ask you guys to do a welfare, and you always do it, you, you guys are fantastic. When we ask for that welfare check, anywhere from 20 to 30% probably, of those well, routine welfare checks result in a hospitalization, that they are suicidal or gravely intoxicated and uh, a danger to self or other, um, usually self. Uh, so we appreciate what you guys do for our veterans and I just want to explain why sometimes it seems odd why there's been a welfare check. But again, with 92,000 veterans to be one of that 130-ish that are temporarily flagged as a high risk, this is a special population. We review that flag at least every 90 days. We try to pull the flag as soon as we can when the veteran has stabilized. Um, very few veterans keep that flag for more than a year. Most of them, uh, are, that flag has been deactivated within six months. But yeah, we do have some veterans who you know, who you visited frequently, who you know, so know you bring in frequently, and we appreciate that. Uh-oh. Uh, oh my, this is animated when it wasn't on my thing. This is just a list of lots of things we're going to cover, so that's kind of useless in the interest of time. Um, of course, most vet the veteran diagnosed with a mental health disorder of any kind of mental illness is at roughly double the probability of uh, making a suicide attempt than a veteran without a mental health diagnosis. But as you may have heard from the recent CDC study of American civilian suicides, uh, roughly half of people who die by suicide do are not diagnosed with a mental health disorder. Now, it doesn't mean they don't actually have a mental health disorder, but it means they didn't get treatment and they weren't diagnosed, at least not that CDC was aware of. Uh, we see more consistency in our veteran population, co-occurrence of some mental illness or substance abuse disorder with our veterans who do uh, die by suicide. Uh, but for all veterans, whether they have a, a disorder or not, it's best to view a suicidal crisis as a short-term aberrant change in consciousness where the veteran is not, or the patient, is not uh, processing information in their normal way, where their problem solving skills are not up to where they usually are, and has typically erroneously, uh, it, is overwhelmed with negative emotion, feels that their life is so miserable that death is better. If we can get a person over the crisis, they're likely to return to their baseline and adapt once again to an adequate or, or very good 
life in a pretty short period of time with treatment and intervention, and you guys are the first responders that bring them to there. Um, bipolar disorder among veterans is associated with roughly uh, three to four times the risk of death by suicide than uh, veterans not diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Depression, on the other hand, is the disorder most commonly associated with um, suicide death. There's more veterans who are depressed than there are veterans who have bipolar disorder. Uh, but both can be a very de deadly illness where suicide is, uh, results. And again, there, as with all mental illness, there's any, just our moods day by day, there's fluctuation. There are periods of crisis, of extreme manifestation of disorder, and periods of at least partial remission where the person is more functional. Uh, schizophrenia or other psychotic disorders, uh, schizophrenia, about one out of 10 people suffering with schizophrenia will die by suicide, uh, especially in the early phases when they're first struggling with that diagnosis. Um, for people at the other end of the age spectrum, dementia is also associated with our older veterans start realizing that the, they have advancing dementia and suicide typically by firearm uh, becomes uh, an enormous risk for them. And as I think we, you all know, a uh, person struggling with a major mental health disorder is far more likely to be a victim of violence than to perpetuate violence. We're much more likely, and much more of our calls to you, are about someone who's a huge danger of violence to themselves uh, rather than to another. Uh, Joan Smith is going to go into much greater detail about t PTSD, and David Grillo already covered a little bit about it. So as you know, some of the symptoms are intrusive thoughts, avoidance of uh, areas that trigger, that remind them of the, of the individual, the, the traumatic experiences, uh, negative <coughs> thoughts and mood, and that state of hyperarousal, super reactivity to sight, sound, motion, um, being super on the alert. Uh, and that, com that can be combat trauma. Interesting what we've noticed with our veteran populations there's not a relationship with suicide risk and deployment to combat versus deployment to non-combat areas. Anyone who served, any veteran who served in any capacity in the military is at a significantly higher risk of death by suicide than our non-veterans. And that's not just for our combat veterans, although of course with combat veterans, PTSD is far more likely to be involved in a, a suicidal incident, and that can be um, the trauma can be combat, it can be from childhood, it can be from a crime, it can be from a car accident, it can be from uh, military sexual trauma, disasters. Um, there are various traumas that can set someone up for PTSD, um, including long-term chronic PTSD from being trapped in situations of domestic violence or child abuse. And of course we see with many of our suicidal veterans a co-occurrence with Substance use, uh, depression is one of the major, uh, the most common diagnoses that we're dealing with with our veterans. So worldwide, about a million people a year die by suicide. There's, a, we don't care how many seconds that is. Uh, it's a second leading cause of death worldwide for those between the ages of 15 and 29, a second. Uh, it's the third leading cause of death for those between 15 and 44 worldwide. Um, just to show you, America is ranked 43rd in the rate of suicide death um, at 17.9 per 100,000 deaths. Uh, Guyana is the number one place for suicide. We will be talking about firearm safety um, in the U.S., but clearly, the, simply the presence of guns does not make people more suicidal. Um, if someone is suicidal and they have easy access to a weapon, it makes it more likely that they will not survive that suicide attempt. I'm sorry about these animations. Um, yeah, as you can see, about 13% of Americans have thought about suicide, and over, oh, nearly 5% 
admit to having made a suicide attempt. It's way too common. Since we've been keeping track of these records uh, from the 1920s, the rate goes up every year. Uh, in fact, some of these slides are a little old, and I'll correct um, the data. Suicide, when I started this job in 2009, suicide was the 11th leading cause of death in the United States. It's now the 10th. Um, every year, the numbers go up. They go up for civilians. They go up for veterans. Uh, as David pointed out, they go up for veterans in our system at a much lower rate than they go up for veterans not in our system. We're doing a lot of things right, and we've initiated several new interventions in the last year, actually, that we're hoping will drive those numbers down. We expect to see, actually see a, at least a decrease in increasing rate, but and perhaps actually a decrease in rate over the next two years. We're hoping. Um, in the civilian community, almost four times as many males and females die by, and females die by suicide. In the veteran community, it's half. Fe half of uh, the, the rate for female suicide death among veterans is half the rate it is for male veterans. These two, um, here's a clue. These two things are related. What might be the reason why there's more male deaths by suicide than female deaths in general, and even among uh, female veterans? Anyone have a guess? It, it's choice of method. It's use of firearms. Um, Non-veteran females are much more likely to poison themselves or cut themselves uh, in a suicide attempt. Um, female Veterans are more likely to use a firearm. Men in general are more likely to use a firearm or hanging. Part of this is, of course, firearms are extremely lethal, as is hanging, and it's easier to accidentally survive a poisoning or to abort uh, an attempt to bleed out. Uh, these other two things take longer, and that's an important point. There's, an, there's always some impulsive element to a suicide. Some of them have been contemplating it for months. But between the decision to actually act, that this is the moment I'm going to do it, and taking that action is usually a matter of minutes. Um, when the action is instant death, that's it, it's, it's, it's a suicide. When it's taking medication or beginning to cut, it takes time to die. And there's that moment of decision, I'm going to do this, this is going to solve my problem. And then waiting for death with increasing discomfort or pain. And in that time, people often get a little bit grounded and reconnect with what the hell am I doing? Maybe this isn't the best answer now. Maybe I don't need to do this now. And they're much, much more likely to abort the attempt, call for help, and of course, they, they're also more likely to be discovered in time to, to save them. Uh, in general, uh, white men over the age of 85, we see a tick up at the end, as we move toward later in the lifespan. Uh, we don't actually see that so much in our male veterans. Uh, the highest risk group, as David mentioned, is our young veterans under the age of 25. Um, all veterans over the age of 55 at a slightly lower risk, but that doesn't really matter because you're dealing with individuals of any age, of any gender, of any ethnicity you're going to assess the individual's risk. But when we look at demographic factors, these are, these are interesting differences. Uh, we actually lost almost uh, 45,000 uh, civilians last year to suicide, 2016 last year with data for, to suicide. Um, it's way more than twice as many deaths than, than there are to HIV and AIDS, and in the, in the US as it is. Um, among our elderly veterans, both male and female, Typically, the last professional to see them alive is not their mental health treatment coordinator, it's not their counselor, it's their primary care physician. And again, that's one reason we're inst instituting much more detailed screens for any suicidal thinking during every primary care visit. So this is the most recent data we have from CDC. The, uh, the broken down by age, the number one cause of death in each age bracket, and of course the sum uh, at the end, is um, unintentional injuries. Uh, so all accidents, those include single car collisions, which probably are actually suicides, um, and drug overdoses, many of which probably were intentional suicides. 
But you know, the medical examiner is going to determine whether something's a suicide or not if there's a very, very large amount of a drug or if there was a note. But no note in a pretty large amount, conceivably an accident, is going to get plugged into accidents. So the suicide death rate's actually quite higher than what we're aware of. We're, we, oh, we can only know when a medical examiner has determined it to be a suicide. Green, of course, are suicides. And as you can see, those under the age of 35, between 10 and 35, it's a second leading cause of death. Uh, under 55, between 45 and 55, it's the fourth leading cause of death. And for those over 55, it's the uh, eighth, uh, not seventh leading cause of death. That's not because there's less people in the general population making suicide attempts or dying by suicide in those years. In fact, it's a little around 7,000 in all those, those last age groups. But um, natural causes come in. So, of course, that's why the, the chart doesn't go to 170. Something's going to get us, um, but suicide is when we get ourselves. The red, just for comparison, is homicides. And you can see how significantly lower that is overall. When we look at methods in the United States, the number one method for people under 14 is suffocation. Number two is firearms. Um, for all the other, the other age groups, firearm is the number one uh, method of death. 49% of all suicide deaths in America are by firearm. And Dave covered some of these details. Yeah, and again, the, the, for female veterans, uh, the, the rate doubled for those not getting their health care in the VA. And female veterans are double the risk of death by suicide than are not veteran females. For police officers, as with our veterans, you guys have extraordinary stressful and dangerous jobs. Uh, officers are two to three times more likely to die with their own hand than they are to die in the line of fire. Um, uh, you know, among your profession, there's a significant amount of PTSD from your job. Um, the most officer suicides occur in officers between the age of 40 to 44, uh, with an average of 16 years on the force. Uh, most were single, and this is also true for male suicides outside. Tend to be single, recently separated, alone. Uh, so in this slide, is just there to advise you to watch out for each other. Look for changes in behavior. If you have a friend who's struggling, um, don't be afraid to ask them if they're having any thoughts of suicide. And we're going to talk about recognizing some of the signs that someone might be suicidal, both on a call where you're going to, to a veteran, but also among each other, among family members, in your regular lives. So both the U.S. suicide rates and veteran rates increased every year. Um, it's a leading cause of death, a violent death for those under 55. Uh, in the 67, as I said, 49% of suicides are by firearm in the general population, but 67% of veteran deaths are by firearm. 69% uh, of males, male suicides among veterans are by firearm. It's important to know that we have free gun locks available to veterans, no questions asked. The VA police have a supply, all our mental health clinics have a supply, and the VA pharmacy now is posting that they have them and has a supply of these. So we're getting them more of them into the hands of veterans. We gave out over 2,000 uh, of these gun locks last year. I haven't seen them showing up on eBay, so that's a good sign. Uh, it's, not, it's not the world's greatest gun lock. The newest version we have actually does also have the crisis, this is an old one, the crisis line number right on the lock. And you'd think that if someone's following up on a suicidal urge and going to their gun and they see this gun lock on it and they realize, oh crap, I gave the key to my partner to um, stop myself from an impulse like this. Maybe I should just go get a hacksaw, maybe I'll get some bolt cutters, I'm going to find my way around that or I'm going to kill myself in a different way. But actually what we've, we've learned is anything that slows someone down when they're in the grips of a suicidal impulse decreases the probability of them following through with that impulse. When um, some VA pharmacies put the medications in bubble packs, uh, where you've got to you know, poke, poke out each pill instead of 
to taking a pill out of a bottle. In the VAs that use bubble packs, the overdose rate, of the suicide overdose rate, is decreased by at least 30%. Just because in the time it takes to punch out those pills, someone who's convinced that death is the only answer for them, death is the right way to end the problems that they perceive in their life. By the time they've punched out a few of those pills, they're like, you know, maybe this isn't such a good idea. Anything that decreases the convenience of a suicide method increases the probability of the veteran surviving. And even having, as we just started doing an RVA, the veteran's crisis line number on the cap, on the bottle cap, we don't do the, the bubble packs here, but the, the crisis line number on the bottle cap can be enough to have someone, it's not as good as a barrier, a bottle they can't open, but it's something that might trigger the veteran to say, you know, maybe I should call first. You know, the first, the first intervention with someone who's suicidal is to start working and realize, you know, maybe I don't need to do this right now. It feels like an epiphany. But if suicide's really a good idea, if it's really the right way to deal with your issues, it'll be the right way in two weeks, it'll be the right way in a month, it'll be the right way tomorrow. It's worth considering that maybe you're not thinking clearly and it's time to take a step back, access some help, and see where to go next. Um, yeah, and we adjust, when we adjust for age, the suicide death rate for males is roughly 30% higher than for uh, male veterans than it is for male non-veterans. And as they mentioned, the suicide death rate is double for female non-rats. It's highest among our, young, our youngest veterans. It's actually very highest among our veterans <coughs> under 25, our very, very youngest veterans. It's about double uh, what it is uh, for the average veteran. Um, the suicide death rate is actually lowest for veterans over 55, but we have an aging population. We have more older veterans than we have younger veterans. Um, and so actually over nearly 60% of our veteran suicides are of our older veterans because most of our pool is our older veterans. But with a smaller number of younger veterans, they're dying at a much higher rate. And we don't have an answer for why. I do think the availability of methamphetamine, personally, is one of the factors. But we have older vets on methamphetamine, too. So here are the myths that get in the way of us being effective in intervening with someone who might be suicidal. Uh, the idea that you might go up to someone and ask, you know, you sound really stressed out. You seem real worried about your court date. You made this post on Facebook saying you don't even know if you'll be here tomorrow. I'm concerned that you're thinking of killing yourself, or I'm wondering if you're, if you're having thoughts of wishing you were dead, or dying by suicide, or having any thoughts like that, that a person would honestly respond by saying, well, no, I wasn't, I just feel overwhelmed, I feel terrible, but now that you mention it, that's a great idea. Thank you, you've given me a solution. That's now, you may have actually heard that at some point, but you heard it from some sarcastic person making a joke. Uh, no one, you, you're not going to put the idea in someone's head by asking about suicide. Everyone in this room, everyone on this planet over the age of seven knows that they have a capacity, a possibility of killing themselves. It's a terrible idea. And for most of us, on most days, it's a terrible, terrible idea. But we're aware we can do it. It's not appealing. You know, if you mention the word, you're not going to give someone the idea. But if you don't mention the word, they're not likely to bring it up. Um, and once you mention the word, when you can ask, come, and as you guys do, I think you, you know this and you do this, you ask, you have any thoughts of taking yourself out? Are you considering suicide? There's a fair chance that someone who is, if you're expressing concern, seem to care about them and want to help them, you got a maybe 50% chance of someone who's strongly contemplating suicide of saying, well, yeah, I am thinking about suicide. And then you can put query further. And that person probably may need uh, to come to the hospital or at least have a safety plan. As you know, most of the work we do with people who are suicidal, of course, sorry, next slide, uh, with people who are suicidal is on an outpatient basis. We don't lock people up long term for suicide. Um, you can't really stop someone permanently from killing themselves. All we can do is delay. But that delay is usually enough for the person to fully come back to their normal level of functioning. 
And even people, and we've worked with them, and you've worked with them, who've made 30 suicide attempts in the past, on most days, they're not trying to kill themselves. There's something very <coughs> different about the days and hours when someone is willing to take arms against themselves than there is during the, every other point in their life. It's not what their life's about. It's not who they are. It's an aberrancy. It's, it's not their normal functioning, even if it's repetitive. Um, but we want to create a situation, open-ended questions, where they feel comfortable telling us what is going on. The other huge myth is that there's talkers and doers. And this is uh, also true that there's low lethality reattempters uh, versus people that you would really be worried about. And we take, and I know you take, every comment about suicide absolutely seriously. Um, the truth is, when anyone's making a major decision in their life, you know, uh, is this the right career for me? Is this the right, right life partner? Is this the right flat screen TV? Um, that there's ambivalence, a bit of confusion, anxiety about making a decision. And when we have these feelings, we typically want to poll people and ask them, what do you think about this decision? Does this seem like a good idea to you? This is also true about suicide. When we, and also because of the ambivalence of maybe wanting help and yet not wanting help. Um, when we look at active duty service people who died on the job, uh, armed services, uh, the people in our military who did die by suicide while serving, um, when we looked at the DOD, looked at the record, about a decade ago, looked at the records of 500 active duty suicides, in over 30% of the cases, there was documentation that they were talking about suicide. They were opening up to, com to command um, to counseling, and it was documented they were considering suicide before they did their attempt. You know there are many undocumented conversations they were also having with friends, with loved ones, um, that didn't get into a record. So people who are going to die by suicide are likely to give signs and warnings and to talk about it and to answer the question, are you thinking about suicide with yes? Yes, I am. Um, so this is why we really, really need to ask. Likewise, People who talk about it and haven't made an attempt, um, even among our professionals sometimes, they begin wrongly turning a, a deaf ear to the individuals. Like, ah, oh, they're always talking about it. they've never done anything, they love themselves too much, uh, they just like talking about it. Every time someone tells themselves, or tells someone else, that they're considering killing themselves, um, they're convincing themselves that this is an appropriate response to a bad enough situation. The situation may not have been bad enough for them to act on it, but every repetition reifies that plan, strengthens their own end game. Perhaps they also help them choose a method and begin to imagine and practice in their own mind following through on that suicide. So people who talk about it are much more likely to die by suicide than people who've never thought about it, never talked about it. It's something already in their toolbox by visualization. Um, so we take any comment about suicide very seriously. If you're leaving a welfare check and or having an interaction with a veteran for any reason, they say something like, you guys won't need to worry about me anymore. You're gonna wanna follow up on that. Now why wouldn't I wanna worry about you anymore? Are you having, are you having thoughts of taking yourself out? Uh, I know you've had a lot of struggles. I've been in your house six times. Are you thinking of killing yourself? And the answer might be, no, I'm moving to Miami. And that's fine. <laughs> and then you won't have to worry about them anymore. But you want to explore. You want to find out what's going on. Um, and of course, the biggest myth that if someone really wants to die by suicide, there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, suicide, that, that suicidal crisis is short term. It fluctuates. It may repeat over and over again, like anxiety attacks can. But the crisis where someone is actually willing to take action tends to be time limited. If we can intervene during the crisis, we can save them from that potential attempt. And we can then perhaps train them in handling that crisis better in the future and being better at riding out these intense periods of vulnerability to suicide. Um, we want to, our job is 
when we've got the, the veteran in our clutches, when we're, we're working with them on an inpatient or outpatient basis, of helping them recognize that suicidality ebbs and flows, and helping them learn to recognize when it starts happening, and, and, and what they can do to de-escalate and get themselves safe. Uh, there was a 78 study uh, done when they looked at 515 people who were wrestled off the Golden Gate Bridge before they could jump. They were trying to jump. They were making a very, very serious suicide attempt. We lose about 50 people a year to the Golden Gate Bridge, by the way. Um, 25 years after their attempts, 94% of them were either still alive or died from other reasons. When we look at everyone, both civilian and veteran data is the same on this one. People who are hospitalized after a suicide attempt, roughly if you've made one suicide attempt in your life, statistically, you're at about 40%, 40, I'm sorry, 40 <coughs> times the risk of dying by suicide than someone who's never done it before, um, just statistically. But when we look at this population, their highest risk period is right after discharge, the, the first week, first month, first three months, and then the, the risk of reattempt starts going down dramatically. Only 11% of people who are so convinced that death is the only way to deal with their problems, that they took arms against themselves or were hospitalized, only 11% reattempt within the first nine months. Those who don't reattempt in the first nine months, it kind of goes down to that historic risk. That's why nine months is a, is a key factor. Um, when we look at the lifetime probability of death by suicide, people who made uh, one or more known attempt, 90% of them, 90% will never die by suicide. So when we intervene, we are likely to save someone's life, not just for a year, not just for a month, not just for five months, but for the natural duration of their life. It's very likely that if you got them over that hump, if you got them in the crisis, that they will go forward. And of course, we look at protective factors. Why would this person kill themselves? They've got a loving family. They've got you know, a music contract. They, you know, they're wealthy. They're happy. They have all these good things. That means nothing to the individual. Su a suicidal crisis is a period of aberrant thought. They are not processing things accurately. They're overwhelmed with emotion. They're not able to recognize the good things in their lives. And they've got blinders on, and they will convince themselves. I've seen highly religious people who believe that suicide will result in eternal torment convince themselves that God will view this as an illness and will forgive them, uh, that their family will not suffer with their loss, that the family who delights in them, yeah, I'm really a burden even though they think I'm a bonus, they'll be better off without me. They'll be sad for a week and then they'll get better when actually that traumatic loss of suicide is going to go with, with the survivors for the rest of their lives. It's going to be a wound and pain. Uh, but the individual isn't thinking clearly. And that's what we have to keep remembering. They're not in their right mind and they're blind to the, the reality of their life and focused only on what feels miserable. So protective factors aren't all that protective. A loved one in the house who's got the crisis line number and is willing to call police and is saying, yeah, that they, they seem safe now. Okay, well, that's a little different. You know, that may decrease the probability of them getting to the hospital, needing to go to the hospital. But again, of course, we say, if there's any risk, bring them to the hospital. I think you also have other things to do. And people get mad when they get brought to the hospital and don't need to be. So, I mean, you guys are actually good, <coughs> and you are good at assessing. Uh, when a hospitalization is necessary, when family can take the person instead, when there's backup. Um, and you can always call the Veterans Crisis Line for their assistance after you've left because someone isn't holdable, but maybe there should be some follow-up of some kind. You can call the Crisis Line. They'll send a referral to Karen and Aaron and I, and one of us will follow up, or we'll get, if they have a treatment team, we'll notify the treatment team and get them to follow up. So the Crisis Line is a really good way of activating the VA, especially for veterans who are not aware of. Even if they're not registered, even if they're dishonorable uh, and not eligible for services, we will help them. At least at that level, we'll link them to community, but we will respond. Um, and this was called SAVE, to know the signs of suicidal thinking, um, ask the most important question, are you suicidal? Validate, and I need to talk faster. Um, so obviously, someone's pretty much holdable if they're threatening to kill themselves. 
if they're looking for ways to kill themselves, including researching methods on the internet, if they're seeking access to killed weapons or other means, or if they're talking and writing about death, dying, and suicide. Hopelessness is the number one um, reason we'd be asking these questions. If someone's life is, uh, feels um, uh, inadequate to them, and they don't have hope of it getting better, they may be considering ways, ways to die. I'm gonna jump, sorry, because I'm realizing I have like two minutes. Um, we know the special, the special risks for our veterans, the special pressures they're under. These are similar to the pressures that police are under as well. Um, suicide by cop is something that unfortunately seems to be increasing in frequency. Roughly one out of six officer-involved shootings are suicide by cop, roughly 60 a year nationwide. So it's relatively rare, and you guys are relatively, are quite good at, especially here in our area, uh, at not, um, at decreasing the probability of, of firing your weapon on someone uh, with doubtful intent. Um, and again, the predictors for both officers and veterans, typically the external triggers for suicidality, relational conflict of some kind, workplace conflict, legal issues, the very, whatever would stress out anybody is what drive, can be the trigger for anybody becoming temporarily, entering a suicidal crisis. And I'm really trying to move us to the crisis line. Um, and this is what you guys do. This is what you guys do very well, consistently. Validate their feelings is a reason you're asking. You sound really upset. Your partner says that you posted this on Facebook. What's going on? Keep, if you're at a point of negotiation with someone who's not willing, really which you guys do great, and you can't control the outcome of that negotiation, the individual is in control of their life. Um, but if you can, once, if you build that rapport, as you guys are so good at doing, um, and get them to keep focusing on their feelings and start accepting that delay, that they ultimately have control over their life and death, but they don't need to make that decision this minute, there's other options this minute, and continue to build, try everything is basically what this slide says. Try to build rapport on any level. If there's a connection with you both having military service, that's great. If that's a trigger for them and doesn't work, connect on music or you know whatever you can connect with. Uh, get them feeling in a build a relationship with them, which makes it so painful when the negotiation doesn't work. But putting yourself out there, making that connection, and reassure them that you're concerned, you're trying to help, you're going to help them. We're not gonna talk at length at safety planning, but the veterans crisis line. A lot of our veterans are afraid to call because they're afraid if they call and say they're, they're stressed, that they may be thinking about suicide, that a rescue is gonna be sent out immediately and you're gonna drag them into the hospital where they don't wanna go. When we look at, we've had, since we established the crisis line in 2007, we've had over three and a third million phone calls there's also been online chats and texts, and all those numbers are on the card, all those access numbers. Uh, we only send police out 93,000 times. That's about 2.8% of the phone calls result in the police dispatch. Usually the person needs a conversation, and the conversation <coughs> can go on for two hours, or can go on for 10 minutes. And of those conversations, they only send referrals um, about a sixth of the time to people like my team. Uh, because all they needed was that conversation to get through the hump. You can call the crisis line if you're concerned about a veteran. You can urge third-party callers, uh, wife, husband, friends, to call the veterans line about, the, that, about the, any issues the veteran has. For the veterans crisis line, no crisis is too small. We have veterans calling because they have an issue with benefits. They, I keep blaming the podiatrist. They can't get a podiatrist to set, schedule an appointment. That's okay, we'll get the referral, we'll fix it. That problem is now on our desk until we find a way to help resolve it for the veteran. Um, 
always encourage them. If they have a nightmare and it would help to talk to someone, they can call it. That same number, when they call that number, there's a, a recording that says press one if you're a veteran. And then they'll go to one of our three call centers filled with trained responders who have full access to their VA records and who can send referrals to us if they don't press one. Or civilian calls and doesn't press one because they're not a veteran, they're not calling about a veteran. That's fine. They'll go to the SAMHSA linked crisis line, which here would be uh, Santa, County, uh, Santa Clara County Mental Health or uh, Star Vista in San Mateo. So that number is good for anyone in any situation. So fill your pockets with those cards and give you know, every veteran at least two, one for themselves, one for a friend if a friend comes in trouble. And I know I've run over and everyone needs a break. But thank, thank you all very much. So we're going to uh, take, let's take uh, maybe a little more than five minutes. We're going to try to be back around 10, so um, let you guys use the restroom, which is just out the door here to the right. Um, and uh, there's a, a Starbucks down the other direction as well. Yeah.